Hi, my name is Porter McRoberts. I'm an interventional spine and pain management doctor here at Holy Cross Hospital. And this morning I wanted to talk to you a little bit about lumbar spinal stenosis, which is a major problem. Uh, it affects uh, an enormous uh, large population in Florida. And it's one of those things that you may not even know you have it until you recognize the obvious signs of it, which are very specifically an inability to walk without your legs hurting or being tired. I see this daily in, in my practice and uh, I, I'd be a millionaire if there were a dollar for every person who told me, well, I just can't walk. I got to lean forward on that shopping cart or on my walker because if I don't, my legs get too tired and I have to sit down. And amazingly, the diagnosis is almost that easy to make. And that's one of the reasons I'm talking to you today, is that you, as yourself, can probably make the diagnosis. If you have difficulty walking because of leg pain, buttock pain, cramping, or numbness that increases as you walk or stand, that's relieved by sitting, with about a 95% certainty, I can tell you without an MRI, without any other clinical tests or lab tests, that you have lumbar spinal stenosis. Now, why does that matter? Walking, as we say, is the supreme medicine, and if you can't walk, there are a host of problems that you're going to have, not only with osteoporosis, but uh, also diabetes, obesity, uh, increases your fall and fracture risk, your heart attack risk, stroke risk, Alzheimer's, virtually everything that can go wrong with you as you age is related to your level of activity in walking. And this is the number one cause of people's inability to walk as they age. If you take your, your age in decades, so let's say you're 90, and you divide by three, your chance of developing spinal stenosis is 30%. So if you're 60, your chance is 20%. So if you take all 90-year-olds, one-third of them will be suffering from this problem. It is a major problem. It's just like knee arthritis or hip osteoarthritis, except it's more common, more prevalent, and for the most part, our only tools to treat this problem have been simply epidural steroids, which work minimally, laminectomy, which works actually fairly well, but it's a large open surgery. And a lot of people are uh, a little adverse to having a big surgery, especially as they age in their spine. Principally because we know that most spine surgeries are challenging. And uh, even though this is, a, in my opinion, a very highly successful surgery, it's still about a three and a half day stay in the hospital. It's about a two to three month recovery. There's about a 26% incident of uh, complications during the surgery. And you know, those, those rates go down with a competent surgeon, but nevertheless, it's a big deal to have someone open your back up and uh, take out the bone and then put you back together. That's been our only options other than another procedure called mild procedure and another one called totalis. So today I want to talk to you about what is a third option. In, in my opinion, it may be the very best option. We've, we've used mild for years, we've used totalis for several years, and while I think those are successful in about 50% of patients, they are not successful in the remaining 50. So what I'm going to talk about today is called a superion interspinous spacer. And to any layman and to any uh, physicist or engineer, the, the obviousness of its utility is, is profound. As soon as you understand what we're talking about, you'll say that's a smart thing to do. It's a procedure that can be done outpatient. If you come in, the way it works is you would lie down on a table much like this one and using a fluoroscope, that machine behind me, which is a video x-ray machine, I simply numb up the skin, put you into a flex position like you're sitting on the table the same position that you don't have pain in. And then I make a little incision in the skin while you're awake and talking to me. And then I insert a spacer and it unfolds inside the spine. And it's like a little jack, basically holding open the space in the spine to decompress the nerve roots, maintaining the same morphology and anatomy of your spine when you sit, when you stand. So it's simply just taking your, your sitting spine and holding it in that same position as you stand. And as you know, you feel good when you sit. That's the whole concept, is to decompress those nerves as you stand and walk, thus reducing the pressure on those nerves so that you have much greater walking tolerance. So there has been a prospective randomized controlled trial, which is the highest level of evidence here in the US. And it was done specifically looking at this device for FDA approval. And they found an enormous percentage of patients doing very well with this. In fact, beating the same number who got relief with typical laminectomy. The principles of this are minimally invasive, 
You can go home or out to lunch practically after this. I want you to be inactive for a few days, of course, to let yourself heal. No time in the hospital, no need for uh, uh, anesthesia. You don't need to be intubated. You don't need general anesthesia. You really don't even need moderate sedation. We can do this while I just numb you up and we talk about your golf game. And you recover very quickly in about a week, uh, seven to 10 days, you're really doing pretty well. And it's reversible. So if it doesn't work for you for some reason, or if you want to change and go on and have a larger surgery at some point, this doesn't burn the bridges at all. So in, in all in all, it's, it's a pretty compelling argument to use this small device. What's difficult is finding the right patients who are out there struggling and suffering who don't know that this exists. So the question may arise, is this something that happens only in one part of the spine or several parts of the spine, or do we have to do multiple uh, attempts? So it's only indicated for lumbar spinal stenosis, which is probably 80 to 90% of spinal stenosis. And usually about 60% of the cases are a single level. So we only have to go after one spot. And the remaining 40 are at two levels. Now occasionally people will have three, four, and maybe even five levels if you're that unlucky. In those instances, this really isn't the answer. It's just simply, this is too simple a solution and you really do need uh, spine surgery to, to solve the problem. Um, also, the other thing is that it cannot be done at the L5-S1 level. And I'll show you on the MRI and you'll, you'll understand, but the spinous process that we're jacking open doesn't really exist at the S1 level, that base level. So it doesn't really work there. But quite honestly, spinal stenosis is pretty rare to find there anyway. So let me show it to you and see what you think about it. And I'll show you a little bit of what an MRI looks with people who have spinal stenosis. So this is the device. It's really just two sizes. It comes in multiple sizes, as so do people. And this is one of the, uh, the, the uh, interspinous spacers deployed. And you can see this is in the open position. This is the position of the spacer that we start with. And you can see how it slides in to the spine. And I'll show it to you. And then we use a little screw. And it simply deploys and opens up these wings to lock them in place, stabilizing the spine. Let me show you on the spine what this means. As we stand, we're in extension. You can see it kind of like this. Our hips are back, and these lamina and these spinous processes are touching each other. And in so doing, it compresses not only the joints, but inside the canal where those nerves are coming from your legs, it compresses those nerves too. As we sit, our hips come up like so, and it brings our pelvis forward and our sacrum forward, and it simply opens up and straightens our lumbar spine, and it takes the pressure off of those nerves. The concept behind the spacer is simple. Simply implant this tiny little spacer between the two segments and hold it open so that when you stand and lean back, it preserves the same anatomy that you had when you sit at that level. All you do is you simply lie down, you numb up the skin, say right here, you put in a little uh, tool that simply spreads open the spinous processes, and you go in and you drop in the spinous spacer like this and it goes in and then you have a little screw that simply opens it up and deploys it. If I can do it, it's a little hard without my screw. Deploys it in the spine and simply holds it open like that. And then you're done 20 minutes later. I sew you up, the incision's about maybe less than a centimeter, just under, and you're finished. And that's it. You walk on out and you go home, you recover for the day, watch the football game, do whatever you need to do. It's that simple. So let's look at the MRI and I'll show you what that looks like so that your doctor, when you're looking at it with him, you can say, hmm, that looks like I have spinal stenosis. Here we are looking at an MRI of some poor soul in the internet. And um, as you can see, um, let me just change that there. You're looking at the, the MRI from what we call a sagittal viewpoint, which is just cut right down the middle, okay? So this would be the skin of the patient. This is the subcutaneous tissue of the patient. These are the spinous processes of this patient that in a very thin person you can actually feel or see. And then this is the ever important canal that houses and holds the nerve roots. And you can see there's the tip of the spinal cord as it should be. And then you see the nerve roots and the white stuff here is the cerebral spinal fluid. And these nerve roots are the main communicators between your legs and your brain. And if they get pinched, as you can see right here, then as you walk, and you can imagine that curve getting worse as that patient stands and walks, it pinches the, uh, the nerve roots. And the further the patient goes, the more pinching occurs, the more tired those nerves get, the more tired the muscles in the leg get. Maybe even they feel dead and weak. You sit down, 
all of a sudden you decompress the spine, let the blood flow back into those little nerves inside the spinal nerve rootlets, and the feeling comes back and you feel good. You can see right here in this one, this is a, a really quite significant level. And so with this patient, we put a little spacer between these two spinous processes right there, and it would straighten out that extra bulge of ligament. And then we'd probably do another one right there and straighten that out as well. But in that instance, the patient would be able to stand up, and then they'd have the same morphology of their spine uh, when they're standing that they had while they were sitting, which is the entire object of the whole simple, easy process. So this concept, uh, my videographer and friend Robert here was just saying, it's, it's just such a simple concept. And it really is, and you would think that it would have been thought of long ago, and it was. So the interesting thing is that this has been FDA approved for years. The problem was the old spacer that was developed literally about 20 years ago popped out about 30% of the time. And that was a major issue. You can imagine, after you put in all these things that are popping out in restaurants, et cetera, that's bad. And <laughs> <laughs> and so how would you do that? Probably you had to take it out and the patient went on. So a 30% failure rate is, is, is bad for those 30%. It's 100% for them. It's great for the 70%, but it, it kind of uh, inured our uh, enthusiasm. So in the prospective study of 100 patients with this inner spinal spacer, they had a 0% pop-out rate, which again now uh, encourages our enthusiasm for the whole concept and idea. So, in summary, it's a simple problem. Virtually everybody will get it if you live long enough. It's a major impediment to your ability to stay fit and active, which is the imperial exercise, is the imperial medicine in my opinion. If you can't exercise, it vastly increases your risk of death and disability and morbidity and mortality. So walking is key. And if you can't do it because you have lumbar spinal stenosis, you need to look for a solution, if not with me, with somebody. But this simple solution of the inner spinous spacer going in between the spinous processes of the spine in a simple outpatient procedure that can be done in 20, 30 minutes without any anesthesia seems to me like a very elegant solution. Thanks for your attention.